Hans Gunther Plus, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. And you are well known in Germany and by some here in the United States as a leading expert in aircraft from at least the Second World War, although I, I know you also have interest in the First World War. And I'm looking at a, a list of things that you are interested in, identification of aircraft parts, the tracing and history of artifacts, you build databases based on the information you gather, research on how, on how aircraft impact during a crash and patterns of dispersion of remains. So studying how the planes crash and what happens, um, the production processes in aviation history, et cetera, and the list goes on. And then you have further interest in um, uh, military hospitals in Germany during the First World War, American and French occupation of Germany in the First World War, and a number of things. And then just as I make my way to the first question, one of the things that uh, Sharon Taylor says about you in her memoir, and that's how I learned about you, was from her memoir. She says, Hans Gunther is an interesting character He's fascinated with the most minuscule segment of a very large picture, fixated on those things to bring into clear focus what happened and where. So just the little information I have tells me that you're a person who has a tremendous interest in detail and that kind of mental stamina it takes to really focus on detail and to create a picture from that detail. So my, my first question is, where did this begin, uh, this interest in not only aircraft, but in the study of aircraft parts and the study of aircraft shot down or crashing uh, in war, the study of what happens when a plane hits the ground, all of these things. When, when did this begin for you? Oh, yes. I did expect the question, but it's still difficult to answer. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you when it uh, when it started. It uh, must be about 1976, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I was uh, still at school, and uh, uh, me and friends were flying model airplanes. And one day they told me, we want to visit the crash site of an US. And we, we actually didn't know which uh, nationality, just the crash site of an aircraft during World War II. And so we went to this crash site and to make the long story short is the only one who did uh, stick on this was me. All others are now doing anything. Every, uh, anything else so <laughs> and the only one uh, uh, would uh, uh, stick with this and then maybe the, uh, the point is that I, I did stick with it is, is uh, my my sense for cur I'm curious about anything and uh, I want to go as you said in detail and I wanted to identify the aircraft yeah. Maybe, uh, actually, everybody wants to identify the aircraft, but uh, uh, if they were on a, uh, if they were finding a crash site, but you, most of them uh, have it easy. Uh, either they uh, have a date or uh, some other information. They know the aircraft type from the beginning, or uh, or, or they have German reports or. So there are so many uh, possibilities how to identify an aircraft. I uh, had the bad luck mm. that I had actually nothing. <laughs> I had just a few pieces. Wow. And, uh, and I had a very, very special case. Actually, maybe uh, the case, uh, this special case is one of the reasons why I went so deep into it. So uh, maybe I should uh, tell you about this case because uh, also it doesn't ha ha has anything to do with Sharon's ca uh, case. Um, 
Sure. When we actually, when we were the first time, the whole uh, it's uh, traced in a wood and a, in a, a steep ravine, and uh, uh, the pieces were uh, littering all around there, small <laughs> pieces, but all around. It, it was 1976. Only let's uh, see that uh, not um, a little bit more than 30 years after World War II. Right. And uh, there was still a lot on top on the surface at the crash site. Wow. Uh, the only thing which uh, was clear quite fast was it was either an uh, English or an American plane because uh, all writings we found was English. Okay. <laughs> that yeah. was the first point, but uh, uh, nobody actually knows uh, what kind of aircraft. Uh, the eyewitness, which were still alive, then said, yeah, it was a big aircraft, uh, multi-engine aircraft, but uh, nobody actually knew uh, 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 exactly what. And um, one thing, the first thing I found that was uh, maybe that that uh, uh, what you call it sparkled uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mark your interest. Yeah, was uh, I found a small piece. It was a, 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 a pulley, aluminium pulley, with a, a, which a Boeing on it. Oh wow! That was easy. <laughs> oh, it's a Boeing aircraft. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. still we had no idea which one. Okay, uh, Boeing aircraft, there were not so many Boeing aircraft flying in, in Europe during World War II, uh, usually just the B-17. Yeah. But uh, still, uh, actually this uh, I did learn uh, uh, much later, uh, the yeah. B-17 is uh, the one aircraft of the United States Army Air Force with the most losses in Europe. No, no other US aircraft in uh, Europe uh, was lost more than uh, the B-17 in Europe. Wow. So, uh, and it's a big aircraft. Sure. So, um, actually, uh, quite soon I found an eyewitness who, uh, uh, who kept a diary and he told me, yeah, the crash took place on, keep it, January 3rd, 1945. Today, wow. uh, 78 years, no, 77 years ago. Wow, yeah, yeah, we're speaking on January 3rd, wow. So January yeah. 3rd, 1945. Yeah, and uh, I thought, oh, perfect, everything is cleared. I wrote to Maxwell Air Force Base, which is a historic research agency, and told them, yeah, I found an aircraft, please. Can you tell me which one it is? It, uh, it's a B-17 that crashed on uh, January 3rd, 1945. The answer was the US Army Air Force did not uh, lose a single B-17 on that day. Hmm. So there's a mystery then. Yeah. The next mystery was, uh, uh, I, I talked to more and more eyewitnesses and I ca uh, came to a woman uh, and she's, she said uh, it was, she said my brother had on this day names day, it was January 3rd, 1945. So I had uh, confirmation twice for the date. Yeah. And, uh, and still no, uh, uh, no chance. Uh, uh, the uh, Air Force said no, we did not, uh, uh, we had not uh, lost any air, any B 17 on that day. And actually, later, saw uh, I got the list of missing air reports and so on. There was no B 17 lost on January 3rd. So I may, I thought maybe the date is wrong. Also, I had uh, confirmation twice, yeah, but maybe. And I first started to check all losses, uh, uh before and after January 3rd. Uh -huh. But uh, as it turned out, n n n no matches. Huh. So, uh, but I knew the, 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 uh, I'm, I'm uh, born in a city, Tram Travers name, and uh, city records were kept uh, 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 during this time. Uh, time and uh, Unfortunately, when I uh, went to the um, 
uh, to the uh, um, the archive mm -hmm. of the city. They told me they uh, uh, gave all the documents to the state archive. Oh wow! And I asked the state archive, and they said, "Yeah, uh, we are still processing the documents. Ask ask us later." <laughs> Yeah, so the, I had to wait another five to ten years until ah, I got yeah, to yeah, wow. documents. And, and all of this is focused on one plane, just wanting to identify one plane. Yeah. One plane. But it it will still getting better. <laughs> yeah, that is it's just the start of the story. When I got the uh, uh, the documents from the city archive, uh, I found, in fact, two documents dealing with the crash. Both documents were written, one on the day of the crash and the second one on the day after the crash. The document from the day of the crash uh, was uh, dated January 3rd, 1945. <laughs> Confirmation. Yeah. Second document uh, again says uh, the aircraft crashed January 3rd, 1945. And moreover, it has more on it. It has uh, 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 information. Uh, it's it actually told that uh, uh, that on the tail of the aircraft, uh, you could read something. It was a C below the C and three three seven seven, I think three two, and below this an H. So, and. I said, okay, I have the serial number because this is a radio call and the serial number of the aircraft is 43-377-32. Checked my files, which I, which I already had and found out, or, or no, I, I checked the aircraft record card for this aircraft and found out this aircraft was uh, salvaged at Davis Montana Air Base in Arizona. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And so, I couldn't so the believe The US it. government is saying we salvaged this plane in Montana. Yeah. The plane that you know was actually in Germany crashed on January 30th. Wait a moment. Oh. Uh, the point is, I can I tell you that the Germans uh, switched to um, uh, digital, uh, uh, numbers. So, but this is, I, I came to, I'm coming to this later. The next step was, okay, that was, uh, 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 I still have a mystery, uh, but I have the, uh, the letter above the number. The letter above the number is uh, uh, correlated to the group the aircraft was flying. I have a C. The problem was uh, the German report didn't say if it was a C in a triangle, a C in a square, but there are only two units which are possible. These are the 96th bomb group and the 303rd bomb group. Wow. And I wrote to the, uh, the historians of both units. And uh, the 303rd bomb group uh, replied very, uh, with, with a very long letter, uh, uh, giving all the information about what happened on this day and what they're flying and they had no losses. It was very conclusive. So I said, okay, 303rd bomb group, maybe not. The answer, uh, the reply from the 96th bomb group was, uh, was a quite short letter. We had not lost a single aircraft this day. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, then I checked my databases, which are, uh, as I told you already had, and found hmm. out that I, there was a lot, uh, there was a, uh, hmm, how I call it? Uh, there's a list of material losses uh, that was collected after World War II uh, for uh, aircraft that flew in Europe. And in this list, I found an aircraft which would have the uh, uh, digital 337723. The last two digits were switched. And that was lost. Actually, uh, it was called, um, I think, missing landed on continent, uh, December 5th, 1944. 
That is also strange because it's, it's a total different date, but yeah. the aircraft belonged to the 96 bomb group. Wow. So the, you have some numbers that were switched. Yeah. When somebody wrote the numbers down, looks like the numbers were switched around then. But then you've yeah. got the mystery of, so maybe yeah. we explain the number, but then you've got a different date. Yeah. Wow. But then I thought now now I, I wrote I wrote everything together and sent it again to the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell and see let's see what happens. Yeah. This is uh, to, to get the picture that was 20 years after I found the first parts. 20 years. And I wrote wow. wrote, wrote to Maxwell and the as the, a wonder happened. I got a reply and they found a, a press release from 1945 covering the aircraft, which uh, the serial number was uh, on it, uh, for, uh, 43337723. This was an aircraft from the 96 bomb group. And the press release said that this aircraft was abandoned over the front on January 3rd, 1945 and turned into Germany and crashed near a bridge. <laughs> oh, great. Wow. The next point is I had now the, uh, the possible aircraft. It was not the, uh, not the final confirmation, but it was a good confirmation. I talked about all these uh, uh, World War II aircraft losses for all years. Oh, yeah, you made a presentation. Talk. You made a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, actually, a uh, uh, schoolmate of me uh, was also present. And I knew his uh, grandfather was at the crash site. And he brought some... Uh, pieces with him that his grandfather took right after the crash from the aircraft. One of them was a flying helmet. Wow. And I said, a flying helmet? Let's see. I turned it around and saw the name and the last four digits of his uh, service number were, were written in it. And this was one of the crew of uh, 437723. Wow. Wow. So, this was a final confirmation that it was in fact this aircraft. And then I wrote to the 96 bomb group about all uh, my findings. And uh, yeah, uh, they were astonished that they lost an aircraft <laughs> this day. Wow. So this is, a, this is a plane that was abandoned, meaning yep. it was airborne and those inside the plane parachuted actually, out and then the plane just crashed or? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, so the, the, uh, the attack was maybe uh, some, somewhere on the Rhine and they had engine trouble and they turned back. And uh, when they were over Luxembourg, uh, the whole crew bailed out and the aircraft turned on aut autopilot back into Germany. Wow. And uh, the, re the, the press uh, uh, report is very interesting because uh, it tells that the uh, uh, crew came down with parachute in the front line and the American soldiers were shooting at them. Oh, wow, thinking they were Germans. Yeah. Yeah, but nobody was harmed. So, wow. fortunately. How long did this whole process from, you know, finding the plane at the very beginning to having this confirmation with the helmet, the number on the helmet? How long did this whole process take then? At least 25 years. Oh, good grief. And you're doing it. I mean, you're doing it. I'm just listening to you. You're doing a kind of archaeological work. You're doing yeah. archival work. Yeah. You're interviewing people. And I imagine you're doing other sorts of research as well. So this just gets it, you know, I think a question about personality. Um, what is it that kept you going at this for 25 years? I think, I think most people would be like your other friends who found the plane and said that was interesting and did other things, but you, you stuck with it for 25 years. What, what was it about, what was it about it that just kept you going for 25 years? I, I was curious to identify the aircraft. 
How did it feel? I mean, so that's that's basically it then, just a, a curiosity. Yeah. We could say in English, it's just sort of a an itch, right? That you just yeah. wanted to to yeah. satisfy. What was it like when you knew for certain you had the answer? That was a relief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Finally, I identified the aircraft. The coast <laughs> is over. Yeah, after twenty five years. I was in search for uh, several crashes near uh, a town, near my hometown in the, in the same area and asked people there. And they told me a few years ago, an American pilot came to this town and uh, asked the people that they should show him the crash site of his aircraft because he bailed out. Huh. The problem was he never, uh, he did not bail out near this town. Uh, so they showed him several crash sites, but it was not the crash site of his aircraft. Okay. So, and uh, uh, I, I thought about, yeah, let's uh, check if I can find uh, the uh, actual crash site of his aircraft. And uh, I, uh, ordered the reports, I had to order them uh, uh, back then because uh, now you can get them all online, but uh, sure. I had to order them and uh, uh, see what uh, is written in there. And uh, it was a pile of a P-38 Lightning. That was the first point. And uh, uh, yeah, it took me not so long in my first case, but maybe uh, as well one or two years because Actually, I knew what I had to do. It's a, it's a different case. Uh, on the other case, I had an aircraft with no information. In this case, I, I knew there must be somewhere a crash site of a P-38 and I, I just have to find it. Yeah. And so I, I uh, uh, went from one town to another town and asked uh, the people if they had crash, crashes in the area, which would match the loss. And finally, I stumbled over his crash site. Wow. And uh, uh, his story was also very interesting. Also, he bailed out. He hit the tail of his aircraft oh, wow. and got unconscious. And he was quite sure that he never ripped the ripcord of his parachute. Most wow. probably, the tail ripped his uh, parachute pack open. Wow. And he was badly hurt. He came in hospital. Uh, actually, the Germans found him and he was taken to a hospital. And uh, then later uh, he went to uh, uh, a Starlag, first Dulag, then Starlag. And uh, he was uh, uh, freed in, I think, April 1945 uh, at, at Nuremberg. So it's interesting. The first case, there's no human that you attach to the plane you just have a plane you have a yeah. helmet but there's no real human yeah. the second case that you just said you've got a human who's looking yeah. for who survived and looking for the plane yeah. and then we come to the case of sharon taylor and now we have uh well we have a missing human and we yeah. have a missing plane and we want to see if we can find both of these, both of these in the same place. The news comes to you that there's an American woman whose father is missing, presumably shot down or his plane crashed over Eastern Germany. And would you help? Is that basically what happened? Would you help find the plane? Actually, the first thing I, I, I always uh, looking because uh, there are a lot of uh, Americans are looking for missing uh, 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 relatives. Uh, how possible it is to find the crash site? Because uh, I know of, of cases where people are looking for crew members of uh, uh, four engine bombers, B-17, B-24, and the whole crew is missing. No. Usually we can say if the whole crew is missing, the aircraft crashed into the channel or the North Sea or Atlantic. Right. So for me, 
as a uh, person who has limited resources, there's no chance to find this. Sure. Yeah. So the first thing I, I, I had to look, how feasible it is for me to locate the crash site. And uh, I checked the missing aircraft report and said, okay, maybe not easy, but this is possible. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you could just sort of walk us through this story, because, um, I mean, you know, the, the remains are recovered and they're brought back yeah. to the US. And, and so it was possible. Um, but what was the what was the process you followed? You know that takes some years. What was the process you followed to um, find the site, which was enough information then for the U.S. government to get involved? What what was that whole process from the beginning to recovery? So, and in, in the early two thousands, uh, it was still possible to uh, find eyewitnesses. Mm. And uh, the first point, I, I knew I, 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 there's a missing air report that the aircraft crashed near this town, near, uh, in the area of Torgo. So uh, I personally know maybe this information is wrong, maybe uh, 10, 15 miles in the area, maybe 20 miles. But uh, usually uh, the crash site must be somewhere in this area. So the first thing is to get eyewitness from, from all the towns and ask them if they know crash sites. And then uh, you can check uh, if the crash sites are uh, maybe German, American, or British, are they bombers, fighters. And so you can pin down the uh, crash sites, which uh, are those with a, 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 which are mo most realistic that the crash took place there. And uh, yeah, so pretty much this was a process. Uh, as I'm not in the uh, living in the area, uh, I uh, uh, asked also a local newspaper uh, to put a, a small, um, what, what, what you call it? Uh, um, sure, an, an article or a notice. An in article, the... yeah. Yeah. And uh, 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 and asking the people uh, uh, to give information to the newspaper, and uh, yeah, we collect about I think 10, 15, 20 crash sites in the area. Wow. And uh, a lot of them, we we actually immediately knew it's not possible because. It's a British bomber or a, a German aircraft, but there were two or three which uh, were very promising. And uh, yeah, one of them was a crash site near near Elsnick. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, it's strange enough. Uh, uh, I, I attempted uh, this twice. Uh, first time, I think, in two thousand two. Uh, and another, uh, and the, uh, another uh, uh, time in 2003, a year later. And I got uh, in 2002 already information on the crash at Elsnick, but uh, uh, the information was so sparse that I didn't know if it is an American or anything else. So uh, uh, that was on my uh, need to check list. <laughs> Yeah. And in 2003, I got more information on the crash and turned quite fast out that it was an American fighter. And moreover, uh, uh, we could uh, very quickly identify it as a P-38. And then the next point is uh, how many P-38s were lost in this area. That's the next point. We don't know if we find a P-38, we, we, uh, it, it, it does not necessarily be the aircraft of Lieutenant Estill because it could be also maybe of someone else. So okay. there were only a very few P-38 losses in this area. And the interesting part on this was uh, uh, three of these I think it were four, there were four P-38s uh, uh, that were uh, 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 possible uh, uh, correlations to this crash site. Mm -hmm. And three of them were, were of a later type. 
and one was of an earlier type. And uh, the one of the in main interesting differences was uh, they changed the aileron on these two. As uh, the earlier one had uh, different ailerons than the later ones, and hmm. moreover, the uh, rather the aileron balance weights were different. Right. And I know the balance weights were is are usually uh, parts that breaks away and. Uh, on most crash sites, you will find uh, remains of the uh, balance whites of the rudder aileron or something. Actually, still, I, I was at a crash site in uh, 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 last November, and uh, we found again uh, uh, this actually a chat, but from the 50s, it's not much later than World War II. And uh, we found remains of the balance whites from the aileron. From this so aircraft, really so this is, this is something you can. Uh, 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 it happens very often that you will find these balance weights. So, my idea was to find balance weight weight because uh, uh, Schoen's father flew the early one. So, if I find an early balance weight, it could be only his uh, her father's aircraft. And. <laughs> Uh, one of the first parts that I found in the field was a balance white from the aileron. <laughs> right, and if if I remember right, you are with a uh, another man who has a metal detector. Is that right? So you go out in the field with the metal detector. Yeah. This is the balance weight, and and you find the you 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 find the one that matches the kind of P thirty eight you're looking for. Yes. Was that enough to then contact the? Defense Department in the U.S. or you know did did they need more information before they would send out a team? Actually, I told Sharon I said I will write a report which clearly shows that her father must have crashed there, and I wrote the report and gave them. Then I think it was JPEG, mm -hmm. and that was the basis uh, uh, on. Uh, uh, on this, that they started to uh, 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 plan the excavation. Another point was that that, that was a, a really, for me, it was quite strange. I, I found the air balance wide, and then I, we had a, a, a little bit bigger signal on the ground, and we took away the surface, and we saw uh, remains of the aircraft. And be, uh, in these remains of the aircraft were the first two bones. Oh, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> that that uh, 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 and we contacted the American authorities and um, uh, from from uh, I think Landstuhl or uh, uh, someone came to uh, to Elsnich and took the two bone fragments with him. So we did we did not ke keep them. We just informed the uh, American authorities. Sure. So you found this balance weight that fit the P-38, you found some bones, handed those over to the American authorities. And I'm assuming you told the American authorities these are probably the remains of Shannon Estill. Yeah. And then they, they would do that investigation. Actually, I wrote the report and sent them uh, to them and uh, uh, since they started to plan the excavation, I think, yeah. Wow. So now you're doing all of this as a volunteer, right? Because you yep. you have you actually have a, another job. This is this is work you're doing as a volunteer. Yep. So you do all of this, and all of this then makes it possible to contact the Defense Department, the agency within the U.S. Defense Department to come. And so um, what memories do you have of, I believe it was three weeks on the ground um, when the Defense Department agency was there and I think you were there and Sharon is there. What, what memories do you have of that time? Actually, the, uh, the memories I have, are, uh, <laughs> to say it short, I'm actually we're good. Because uh, I was also with friends there, I met Sharon again, and uh, was introduced to the people, which were quite nice. It's a different point. Uh, so, uh, if it's diff it's different, if you come to uh, excavation, you you do not know anyone. That's a 
total different thing. They, they, they need to get used to someone, but uh, it was easier with uh, Sharon at the place and, uh, uh, get, uh, and uh, some friends also there. Yeah. And um, what sorts of things did you, did you find during that time where you were there, Sharon is there, the, Depart the Defense Department agency is there, um, what other sorts of things did you find that confirmed that this was the plane? The best confirmation was the data plate from the engine. So, uh, so there was a serial number on the uh, on the data plate which matches the serial number on uh, the missing aircraft report. So that was a, a definite, uh, absolute positive correlation. Right. I'm sure you were you were pretty confident already, but this this yeah. was absolute confirmation. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the point, uh, or what I want to tell you, is that uh, nevertheless they need a DNA test because one problem with serial numbers is even serial numbers which are matching uh, can lead you in the wrong direction. That's a, a difficult. Uh, you have to see. That's a, one of my uh, current projects to uh, 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 create databases on serial numbers. And uh, I'm writing all these reports. And uh, for example, machine gun reports. Uh, if machine guns are a number, a zero numbers in the missing in the report, uh, I would say about five to 10% are either corrupt or wrong. Oh, wow. And moreover, uh, you can find one and the same serial number, for example, for gun, and two, sometimes even in three different missing air reports. Oh, is that right? Okay. So, so, so and that's the point. That's maybe the reason why they, or, or actually they do it, uh, uh, I think, every time, but they, they made a DNA test, and this was actually the final confirmation that it was. Right. So, so you had the material confirmation, and then finally the, the DNA confirmation as well. Yeah. So you've described three discoveries that you played an important role in. Um, one is where it all begins, this plane that you, or this crash site in 1976, and that's when this whole process starts. And a 25-year process, that's amazing, of finding out what that story was. That's, that's amazing to me that a person would be that persistent um, in that kind of detailed way. It's very impressive, you know. And so then, but then you finally, you, you get the answer to that. And then you have the second case where the veteran bails out of the plane, wants to find his plane, and so you bring the veteran and the plane together. Yeah. You played a central role in that. Now we have a case where you're playing a central role in um, a daughter wanting to have some sense of, I don't know what the right word is, she wants to find her father. She wants to find the remains of her father. Yeah. And you play a central role in that. And this, I'm assuming that, you know, when you, at the end of the day, when you know for certain that this story has been written, you know, you're working on the story for years, and then there comes a day where you can go to bed that night and say, this story is written. I'm assuming that this case of bringing the of, of connecting the daughter and her father's remains, I'm, I'm just assuming that must have had a deeper meaning for you than the other cases. Is, is that right? Or how, how would you describe that? Actually, it has a deeper meaning because I met Sharon. Right. Because I, I'm fine. Uh, actually, I, I, I wrote I think half a dozen reports on aircraft, which uh, where the uh, pilot is missing for DPA. And they re recovered, let's see, one, two, three, four of them. Wow. But it was never the, 
Sharon was something special, uh, or Lieutenant Estot's case. Because there's that living human being here that's right next to you, that you're connecting, yeah. the, the remains in this person right here. Yeah. 